want to welcome everybody to Somerset Oral History Gathering. Today we're going to interview a couple of uh, gentlemen who came in the 1970s and have been a big part of our community ever since. Leroy, Leroy Myers, he grew up in Collegeville, Minnesota on a farm, went to St. John's for a year and decided to join the service and he volunteered for the draft in 1966, came out in June of 68. He is a graduate of the St. John's in accounting and he worked at 3M. Has three children and spent uh, four years in Europe in the time he's been here. And today he's going to talk on the first infantry division that he was in in Vietnam. To my right is John Teleshow. John came uh, in the 70s also. He grew up on East St. Paul, went to Johnson High School. Uh, he went to a vocational school for a year and worked at various jobs. Then he decided he wanted to buy this nice new Mustang Mach 1. So he went to buy it, but the dealer said, well, maybe you better check on your draft status. So he went back and checked, and they told him it was in the mail. So no Mach 1 for John. <laughs> he was in the 101st Airborne from 1969 to 1971. He was married during the Vietnam War to Rose. They have two boys, and he works for Aramac Vending and Service. And, and uh, they would turn it over to Leroy. Thank you. Uh, basically, I'll give you a little bit of, bit of background about what I did in the service. Uh, I was went to uh, St. John's for a year, and I sort of got tired of school and decided I'd get my service over with. So I volunteered for the draft, and my mother said, aren't you going to work this summer? I said, I'm going into service. So basically, I uh, went down, took some tests, and uh, the second day they had me on KP for two hours, and they said, uh, you get a choice, you can be on KP for four days, or you can attend leadership school and become a uh, acting corporal when you're in basic training. And so I decided, well, rather than uh, spend my time in KP, I went to the leadership school and I was a acting corporal, which they call, so call an acting jack, but I don't know what the last part of the jack is. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting, sure, and no basically uh, we were in charge of a squad of uh, trainees. So then I scored high, so I had a chance to go to officer's candidate school. I signed up for finance, data processing, and armor. And because of that, they sent me to advanced infantry school. So I got to Fort Ord, California, and they said, well, you know the drill. Do you want to go on KP, or do you want to go to our leadership school? So I said, well, I'll take the leadership school. So there again, I was another acting jack, a corporal. So I took a week in each of these leadership schools, but it was very valuable. You learned quite a bit about the Army, and you also learned about training people. And uh, you also got to know a little bit more about the uh, people from the United States, because before this I'd been mainly in Minnesota, Wisconsin. I hadn't met a lot of people from across the United States. So while I was in uh, advanced infantry training, my orders came through for uh, infantry. There were 68 of us that actually turned down our orders, and they said, well, you know where you guys are going to go. You're going to go to Vietnam. We said, yes, but we'll only go there once instead of two tours of duty. And I also didn't want to go for an additional four and a half years. It would have meant for me to go <coughs> six years instead of two years. So I turned down my orders, and they called us all together, and they started off reading the names Vietnam, 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 Vietnam. And then it was a Germany, and I ended up going to Korea. So I was in Korea for six months, and uh, basically I was about 20 miles from the DMZ. In between, I was in Camp Casey, which was in between the demilitarized zone and Seoul. And I got a number of awards. I got this award for counter guerrilla warfare school. And then I uh, became Battalion Soldier of the Month, Brigade Soldier of the Month, 7th Army Soldier of the Month, and came in second in the 8th uh, Army of the uh, Month. And each time I got a three-day pass to Seoul, so it was a pretty good gig, you know, taking all these tests and that. And uh, it also gave me a bunch of experience in working with the sergeant majors and also with lieutenants. So from there I took a month off and then I went to uh, Vietnam. When I got to Vietnam, I had basically eight and a half months left in service. So uh, I also was 20 years old, so I was about a year older than a lot of the enlisted men that were in. When I went to Vietnam, the day that I was flying over there, there was a large battle going on. There's a book written about it that uh, I'll go into later on called The Beast Was Out There by Major General James Shelton. And basically the uh, Black Lions uh, uh, 
two infantry companies were hit very hard and they took 134 casualties. There were 77 wounded and 57 killed. And so when I came to Vietnam, I went to the replacement depot and on the second day they took 110 people and they went out as replacements for the people that had been wounded and killed. Luckily I went into the 1st and 28th, so I had a little bit more time to acclimatize myself and also for additional training before going to the uh, area that I was working with. So that's basically how I uh, got into Vietnam and I was with the 1st Infantry Division which is one of the oldest inf infantry divisions in 3M. Or in <laughs> 3M. <laughs> Big Red One, they call them, and basically I was with the 1st and 28th Infantry. They had the 26th Infantry with it, 18th Infantry. We had an engineering battalion attached to us, an aviation battalion, so we had our own helicopters. Signal Corps, so we had our own communications. Maintenance battalion. Uh, logistics Battalion, Intelligence Battalion, although we question how much intelligence there was because we didn't seem to know what was going on. Medical Battalion, uh, MP Company, Logistics, and uh, different artillery units. So basically it was pretty well a self-contained unit. And the Army actually now is going back to that. So when they send a division to Iraq, for example, that they can have all of the components going with it. In Iraq right now, those same components, you might have the armor coming from Germany, you might have Army Reserve filling in some of the infantry, you might have Marines filling in the infantry, you might have logistics supplied by Halliburton or some outsourcing <laughs> firms. So it's a lot harder to coordinate all of that. And they're going back to the area where you would have everything included in the division. So what I'll do is I'll go through a little more detail as I go through my slides in terms of what our operations were in the uh, field. The area that it was in Vietnam, <clears throat> this is only half of uh, South Vietnam. There's a larger portion. But basically the 1st Infantry Division operated from Saigon up to the Cambodia er area. It was about 75 miles to 100 miles by 75 miles. And we were in the 3rd uh, Corps. The 4th Corps was the Mekong Delta. 3rd Corps was the Central Highlands. And John was in the first corps, which the DMZ is right up here, and uh, this is the area where the 101st Airborne was operating. And the Marines were in this area. So if you look at South Vietnam, it was about 600 miles long, but very thin, like 100 miles wide, 125 miles wide. So the problem is it was hard to defend because the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which the Viet Cong used to resupply their troops, ran along through Laos, Cambodia, and uh, it was a lot more difficult to defend than if you had basically an island that you could throw the Navy around and uh, secure, make sure that no supplies got in. So I'll get into a little more detail as I go through my slides, and then I'll talk about my book, and then a, uh, the moving wall is coming to uh, the River Falls area. <coughs> And John and I belong to the Vietnam Veterans of America, so I'll talk about the dates and what the moving wall is and what that means for the community and the Vietnam veterans. John? Okay. I guess I'll kind of follow his scenario. When I got drafted, I was kind of like a fish in a tree, too, with not knowing, you know, being, growing up in St. Paul, and they said, you're going to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And I could not visualize what a fort would look like other than maybe something from uh, Rin Tin Tin, you know, with Fort Apache <laughs> with the stockades around it. And they also said, and when you get down there, you will be going to the reception center. And well, I knew receptions, you know, polka bands and maybe a keg beer. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of right in the mood for that. And while we got down there, and the guy wasn't, the guy who was running out of that building onto that bus didn't seem too happy for some reason or another. And I, my image of a reception changed instantly. <laughs> and we were going to be in this reception center for one week. We finally got to bed. It was approximately 2 o'clock in the morning. And it was probably 4 o'clock in the morning. I got woke up, KP. I wasn't given the option that Lee was. So I got to do the duty there. And then from there, we went to basic training, which was a cross post and another fun adventure. And first day there, KP. <laughs> And from uh, 
after basic training, went to advanced individual training, which was artillery at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And there again, we got in late at night and told okay, KC in the morning, and guess who had KP? And John, somebody had it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had it put in a word for me there. <laughs> so and then from there, I went to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington to be shipped over to Vietnam. In the meantime, I'd come home and it was, uh, well, well, to back up a little bit, while I was in basic training was when a uh, man had walked on the moon. And so we got to watch that and kind of good to get an afternoon off. And then AIT, and then from AIT come home on leave, and this was in the middle of November, and so my mother, my my dad had passed on when I was a kid, but my mother and family, we all got together, and I was engaged at the time to my wife-to-be, Rose, and we had an early Christmas, because I would not be home for Christmas. And so now we're going forward to Fort Lewis, Washington, and first day there, KP. <laughs> and from there we get on a plane, and the plane, we go to, we stop at Hawaii to refuel, from Hawaii to Wake Island, from Wake Island to Okinawa, and then from Okinawa to Vietnam. And when you get to Vietnam, is at Cameron Bay, which is north of Saigon, and you're going to be there until you get assigned your unit. And at that point, first morning, you know where I was. <laughs> I had a lot of experience. I had a lot of experience. Yeah, I had cross spoons for my. <laughs> so, then from there, we were, they would assemble everybody and they'd tell you what unit you're going to. And at that time, they says, "Okay, tell shell, 101st Airborne." And I went up to the guy. I says, "You must be making a mistake." He says, "Why is that?" I says, because I'm not a paratrooper. And he says, right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we went up to uh, Camp Evans to do a week of prep training before they send us to our regular unit. And of course, first day there, KP. <laughs> and after a week there, went to Camp Eagle, which is where our battalion was out of. And I was going to spend one night there, or approximately a night and a day, and then go out to the fire base where the unit that I was going to be with is at, the 2nd and 320th Artillery. And of course I caught KP, the first, <laughs> the first and last day at Camp Eagle. And I was mentioning to one of the fellows there that, you know, this really sucks, I've been getting KP every place. Well, the good news is, he says, out on the fire base, you don't have mess facilities, so there will be no KP. <laughs> Great. So I get out to the hill, and we get, it's my first day there and the next morning they wake me up and says, oh, by the way, you got crap burning ATL. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have KP. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was a daily job as far as on the fire base. And we would move around. We'd always move by air. We'd have uh, Chinook helicopters that would come in and pick up our guns. I was on a 105, 105 millimeter howitzer. It was a crew served weapon. It, could, it would fire about a 45 pound round approximately seven and a half miles, and we would be in support of the infantry. And that map up there, we moved all around there, out to the Laotian border and through the Offshaw Valley. And there's a book here written of the time. This ripcord was a fire base that was right next to us. And they got completely overrun, lost the entire hill. Uh, one of the people killed on there was uh, Chuck Norris's brother, who was killed on ripcord. And they would be, all night long, they would have the flare ships and that flying around, and it, we would always say about somebody's birthday, you know, just to kind of make light of the moment. And from Ripcord, well, from that area, we went out further into the valley, and then I went on R&R, &R, married my wife, and a guy who was with us in Vietnam, Danny Rosick, him and his wife, happened to be in Hawaii at the same time, so I asked them if they would stand up for us, and they did. And then we went back to Vietnam, and we ended up being out on the other side of the Alshaw Valley, where we kind of got cut off for a while. And I ran across a general years later, and he asked me if I knew a guy named Redleg, if I remember a guy named Redleg. And I says, yes, I do. Why is that? And he says, well, what did you think of him? And I says, he used to make us mad, because if we weren't up all night firing, during the day, you'd be breaking out ammo, and if this guy decided to take his helicopter off for a ride, he'd come on. 
I want some rounds fired here, rounds fired there. He'd get his rocks off by putting us to work. And I said, so he really made it rather tough on us. And he says, oh, by the way, I'm Red Lake. <laughs> <laughs> he was a three-star general, and he told, he says, you know, we got talking. And he says that uh, the people back in division, he says, the bets, the guy who made the money was the guy who said you guys would come out of there, make it out of there. And that was like, well, I didn't know that. <laughs> Had I known, well, you well, couldn't exactly walk away. But, but uh that was really ironic, and then we sat and talked for a while, and he was asking what life in Somerset, Wisconsin is all about, and I was telling him, and he was, then I asked him, I said, where, where are you normally from? He says, well, we're, I'm out of the Pentagon, and I says, well, how's life in the Pentagon? And he says, you know, out here, this was at Fort McCoy, he says, I got my chopper, he says, I can go anywhere I want, I can even call, call artillery if I want, <laughs> he says, I'm the king of the hill, he says, back at the Pentagon, he says, we trip over each other to see who gets to make the coffee, but... <laughs> So then, and afterwards, we you know, went back home, and Rose and I lived in Oklahoma for a while. I finished out my military time, and Danny, the, the people who were the best man and maid of honor in our wedding, we stayed in contact. They were from West Bend, Wisconsin. We stayed in contact with them throughout the years, and a year ago, last February, Danny died of Agent Orange. Hmm. So, and there's been a number of people from our unit that have passed on. I was sick. Fortunately, I'm not one of them. Okay, I think what we'll do now is we'll go through the slides, and John, you can add in at any time sure. some things uh, in terms of artillery and that, because uh, basically John is an uh, expert in artillery, <laughs> whereas I'm just a rifle man. What I had done is I had taken about a third of my shots with slides because slides was the only thing available to do slide film. About a third were in black and white color film and a third were in color film. So what you're seeing here is the slides, but that was basically when I first got over there. I recorded a lot more things when I got over there than I did later on in my tour because uh, the newness of things and that. This is basically a uh, Caribou uh, C-147 plane. We would occasionally, when there were uh, small landing strips near where we were going, we would use the uh, airplanes for transportation. We also used uh, Chinook helicopters, and if you see there, that's a C-47 Chinook, which has got a sling underneath it, and they can be carrying food or ammunition to uh, different uh, bases. And in fact, your 105s, Johns, they would carry with those too, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. They had bigger helicopters that looked like a crane that they called Sikorsky helicopters that could lift more weight. But the C-47 was a workhorse of the Vietnam War era. And in fact, it's still used now in Iran and Iraq. That basically shows the other way we trans were transported was via Huey helicopters. We had our own aviation battalion and this shows them getting ready early one morning getting the helicopters ready to go. This is a, uh, if you look right down the middle, it's a road, and there's a convoy going up the road. I took this picture from a helicopter, and in the, to the right, you can see there isn't any vegetation growing at all, and that's because uh, they had gone through their probably Roman plows, and then they sprayed it with Agent Orange, which is a herbicide to keep the vegetation from growing. It did make it safer for the convoys because it would be hard to ambush you if you were on the road from the trees because it's pretty far away. But uh, it did a lot of damage to the environment and the people. And there's another picture of the road. And in the middle part, there's a, uh, you can see there's a ring there. That's an artillery base and there's concertina wire around it. So on, Highway 13, for example, about every 15 to 20 miles, we would have another artillery base to support the infantry and to support the uh, tanks in the area. That were just flying in a helicopter operation. It would look really peaceful, so you'd be up in the sky and it just looked lovely. And then once you landed, all hell would uh, break loose. So in two minutes, you could go from heaven to hell. You know, quick transition. <laughs> That's just uh, how, uh, uh, like a uh, French colonial house out in the middle of nowhere. 
We were also supported by the armor. That's an M48 tank. When we were on road clearing operations, I showed you that road before. Basically, in addition to having it cleared with herbicides, we would post infantry along the route when they were supplying the base camps. And that way it was fairly safe because we had tanks running on it. We would sweep the area for mines. And they might spend one week just bringing supplies in one week out of the month and then turn it over to the civilians. And basically they would run from about 11 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock just bringing supplies in. Convoys would be 100 to 110 trucks bringing in ammunition, supplies, <coughs> lead in the front by the tanks, supported by the tanks with infantry on the side. It actually was pretty good duty because you usually weren't attacked because uh, they could call in the tanks very quickly and dump ships. You had a very defined area of operations. You had artillery on call, and the gunships, the helicopters could quickly find you. That's just another helicopter flying over the jungle area. I like to take pictures of helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> this was this is on the cover of my book, and it's basically we were going into Budap, which was a camp near Cambodia, three miles from Cambodia, that was overrun by the uh, BC-94. So if you look at that, it isn't the clearest picture, but I do on the right side, I got a demolition pack, which was 20 pounds of uh, C4 and fuse and that. I started out as a demolition expert. And then uh, M16 rifle in my hand. And since they didn't know how quickly we could get resupplied, we had to take enough ammunition with the last uh, three, four hours. So you end up carrying about uh, 75 to 80 pounds a year. So the helicopters were pretty loaded. We put uh, six to seven infantrymen in each one of those helicopters. And as soon as they landed, or they actually didn't touch down. Sometimes they'd get a foot away. Sometimes they'd touch down and it was relatively safe. They'd be off of there in about a second and they'd take off. Because you'd hear clink, clinking noises as the bullets would go through the helicopter. One story I have with a helicopter is when I was coming back from R&R, &R, going back out to the hill, there were six new guys, cherries called, going out to the hill and uh, they asked me if I'd make sure they got on the right bird. So I briefed the guys, tell them, okay, when the bird comes in, three of you guys on this side, three of you guys on this side, all you do is sit down with your legs hanging out, there's, you're not strapped in, there's no seats, you're just sitting on the floor of the helicopter with your legs hanging out the door. And I jumped in next to a door gunner because there's a little jump seat, best seat in the house. And as we got going, I made the mistake of telling the door gunner that six new guys. And so next thing I see him with his headset, and I see the pilot, the co-pilot, turn around, and they kind of look at these guys, and they're smiling. <laughs> next thing you know, we're going up, we're going up, we're going up. And I've never been that high in a helicopter. <laughs> we are way high. And they've got this thing from what I've learned later called a simulated crash. And what they do is just level their blades, and I think it's straight down. <laughs> <laughs> now that thing is just straight down, and they're pretending they're hitting switches and everything else, like the panic goes on, and I'm beginning to believe it myself. <laughs> it was maybe about 100 feet from the ground, they just leveled out, and now we're going to fly nap in the earth. We're going through trees and everything else, and just totally hauling butt. And by the time we got to the hill, these the new guys, half of them had already tossed their cookies. We got off the chopper and he says, is it like this all the time? And I go, I hope not. <laughs> and I've been many and many of flights, but that was the one. Sorry. No, that's okay. And usually we would fly five helicopters in flight. So the first two would be relatively level. The fifth one, because of the air turbulence, would be going up and down. You could drop 30, 40 meters in the air pocket just like that. Actually, it was sort of an exciting ride. But they would turn, you would sit there, usually we didn't have our legs out, out the door because they would turn sideways and there were a couple of times you'd look straight down at the ground and you'd wonder how much centrifugal force was going to hold them. <laughs> Otherwise, shoot, go sliding straight out. But it was exciting. There they're getting the helicopters ready for a uh, mission. That's a uh, fire base uh, next to the road. If you look around the outside, there's concertina wire. That one had uh, two rows of concertina wire. Usually we would have three rows. Uh, and then artillery in the middle. Usually there were infantry foxholes on the outside. I can't tell for sure if that had them or not. If you look way to the right, you see all those holes? 
The road was just pocketed with holes. Each one of those was probably an artillery shell or could be a bomb. When I got over there in 67, you look, it's, it's all cratered and pocketed already. And uh, it was a lot more cratered after I left, and it was a lot more cratered after John left. Mm -hmm. What would be the diameter of that fire base? There? That would probably be about uh, half a mile from one side to the other. That's a small one. Within the clearing? Within the clearing. Yeah. And see, in our yeah. neck of the woods, that would be a big one. Yeah, these, these are rel that would be relatively small. We had, we had one that was just super big, and they had all kinds of artillery in there. They had, 175s in there, 105 tanks, and uh, basically what they would do is when the generals came and the senators and that, they would take them to that fire base and say, mm -hmm. nobody would dare attack us here. <laughs> that was a showpiece. But they did attack, but it was not very successful because there was all kinds of stuff just packed in one small area. But that's where they showed the generals. They wouldn't take them to a little place like that, or the uh, senators or the vice president or president. That's just the village we flew over in uh, Anlock. That's just part of the jungle. You can see that they was cleared for uh, Agent Orange and it affected some of the trees for the back. Just uh, flying along. That's a medevac helicopter. Basically the medevacs were not armed and they would evacuate the wounded. And usually we would have, we'd have to carry the wounded out to a secure area. Uh, where there weren't any Viet Cong, and then the uh, medic backs would come in. They did not like to go into the hot LZ zone, but they would if they absolutely had to. That was our chapel in uh, Phu Vinh. We were only, I was only there about uh, two weeks, and then we moved on to another uh, base camp. There I was at uh, Quan Loi. You can see on my right side, I've got the demolition pack. I've got Claymore mines in front of me there. Smoke grenades on me. The camera is the black thing way to the right. Uh, gas mask down below. And we would carry 75 to 80 pounds on a daily basis. This is how you go out on, on a patrol into the jungle. They didn't mind you carrying cameras? Uh, no, they didn't. It was sort of hard to get film. I'll show you some pictures I took later on. And that was just the dump I went by, and the uh, Vietnamese people are picking through the metal and uh, goods. This, when I first got there, it was a monsoon season in October. And if you look at there, we're out on patrol, and we're about uh, 15 meters from each other, which would be about uh, 20 yards. Uh, actually, about uh, 15 yards, 20 meters. And the reason for this is basically, if you've got a mortar attack, you'd only have one person killed instead of a bunch. So we were always telling people to spread out there. And luckily during the monsoon season there wasn't as much combat because they had a difficulty moving troops and equipment in the uh, rain. But everything got rained. And then during the dry season everything was totally, uh, totally dried out. So it was total extreme. During the wet season it started out right, raining every third hour, then it would rain every hour, and then it would rain all the time. Nobody would say, is it raining, because it was raining all the time. Things would rust up in that. Did the tunnels get part out where they lived? In the... Not too bad. They, would, they were pretty good at constructing tunnels. They would construct the three levels or five levels down, and I don't know how they did it, but uh, basically in the clay that they were digging, I think they had them. I, I never saw. They wouldn't have tunnels here. They would have tunnels in the higher land. That's another uh, part of the, uh, on the monsoon season. You can see how tall the grasses are in that. This I took is a picture of a tree that had been logged off. And that tree would take about five people standing around and spreading their arms out to get around it. So at one point in time, there were some very big trees in that area. Another picture of the jungle. Right in the middle, you can see a helmet. There's a helmet to the left. Visibility was uh, pretty poor during the uh, wet season, and uh, basically it was a lot of work cutting through the jungle. Certain areas it got so thick we take machetes and get to chop through the machetes, and that was a lot of work. There's a Chinook helicopter coming in to pick up uh, troops. There you can see that we're assembled for the uh, Chinook helicopters coming in to pick us up and carry us to another base. 
Uh, that's just a Chinook helicopter we flew, right? That's uh, again out on patrol in the uh, wet area, monsoon season. This actually I took, uh, we made contact with the enemy and the enemy are actually in, just past those trees there's a rice paddy and you can see that there's some uh, dust there. I was taking these pictures with my Kodak 125mm camera. This shows it better. If you look in the middle of the screen, there's three people there. That's our machine gun crew. We're running two, two parallel squads. So the squad alongside of us was firing at the enemy that were in the tree line across from the race paddy. Now this is actually a pretty good setup. Our motto was find them, fix them, and finish them. Find the enemy, fix them would be nail them down with machine gun fire in there, and then call in artillery or air strikes to finish off the enemy. Now the Marines might have fixed their bayonets and charged across that crazy thing, but we didn't do that in the first infantry division. We believed in using anything else but uh, bayonet. This is the same thing, but there's been a, a bomb dropped over to the left, and you can see there's uh, smoke coming over, and they're bringing the... Uh, actually, there's a phantom jet right in the middle there going screaming through. That's uh, another picture of the machine gun crew sitting up. There you can see there's a phantom jet to the right there, coming through to bo drop a bomb on the enemy. Oops, hit the wrong one. There's the Phantom Jet coming in. I also have a picture of a gunship coming in and the gunship dropping uh, things on it. There's a medevac coming in. There's another picture I took of the, while we were flying in the helicopters, of another <coughs> helicopter loading up Chinook helicopters. They could carry about 60 people at a time, 60 to 70 people. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I said, we would fly in flights of five, uh, slick, those are slicks coming in helicopters, and they would call the five helicopters a flight. When I talked about the battle before where there were 134 people uh, killed and wounded, uh, the, gen the uh, Major General Sheldon, who was a, kid, who was a uh, colonel at the time, said he saw the company go off and we left in five of these flights, 25 helicopters really. They came back in two. And then there were four truckloads of people coming as replacements. This is a pretty neat picture because if you notice they're all landing at the same time. Perfect formation. Just another picture from the helicopter, M16, rifle to the left. Sort of silhouetted it getting the helicopter ready to go in the morning. This is the same picture of that uh, combat area. There's a gunship coming in. Gunships would come in and uh, fire rockets at the enemy and also they had uh, cannons that would fire a hundred rounds a second. And this was a Cobra gunship, which is a new gunship. The things looked strange because they were like three feet wide. And the pilot would sit in front and co pilot a little behind them. But they had some awesome firepower. The idea being being that narrow, they were long but narrow, they couldn't get hit from the front. But as soon as they turned to the side, they made a nice tempting target. And uh, they moved us in the same firefight. They were worried about the first column being outflanked. So they switched us to the left to make sure that we could cover it so we weren't being surrounded. There's another picture of the jet coming in. Helicopter coming in at uh, close range. You can see we're actually in the elephant grass. I take this picture, I was standing up. And my buddies were saying, lay down you fool, you're gonna get us all killed. <laughs> ah, ah, I was taking pictures. Kodak Kodak. <laughs> yeah, I was a Kodak Kodak. <laughs> and that's when I quit taking pictures. They got a little too close. <laughs> I was hoping I had a photographic lenses, but no, I didn't. That, that bomb hit right on the other side of, on that row of trees. And just the smoke just rolled over us. So that's, what, that's when I quit my uh, 
photo taking. That's us out on patrol, going down the road, uh, infantry spread out. Towards the end of the monsoon season, you can see there's a few clouds in the sky and it's muddy on the road. And the stuff would be get all mucky if that attached to your boots and that, and your boots would be about that wide on each side. Before you know it, you'd be carrying an extra four or five pounds on each boot. Clean it off, start out again, get more mud. It's a jungle picture with a friend of mine. You can see we sort of stripped down a little bit so that you wouldn't keep, try to keep uh, cool. And it'd be about 100 degrees, 110 degrees. Got to make sure that you took your salt pills and you also cleared a lot of water along because you'd, you'd really sweat. The average person lost 20, 30 pounds over there. I came over there, I was like 168 pounds and I dropped down to about 142. Skinny as a rail, but everybody lost weight. That's just a picture out of a helicopter. That's what the pilots see when they're flying. This was uh, near Anlock, and if you look at it, it's a French armored vehicle that was blown up. A relic of a previous war, but we're using the same base camp, and basically fighting the same people. And there's some smoke rising in the background. Everything was always either exploding or burning or whatever. There at the same camp, they brought in a Quad 50. This was a World War II anti-aircraft weapon. But instead of using it for anti-aircraft, they would use it against anti-personnel. And we were actually attacked at a base camp one once when we had that right behind us. And that put a lot of firepower on them because it's 450 caliber machine guns. We put out a lot of rounds. That's a picture of me sitting on that same armored vehicle. Uh, as you can see, the uh, ground is all brown and that. And it was just, you can see the explosion hole on the side. That probably was blown up in 1952 or 54. 54 was the end of the uh, 52 was the end of the French involvement in Indochina. So probably early parts of the 50s, and we're there in 67, 68. It's probably still there now if you want to visit it. <laughs> uh, that's me at uh, Quan Loi. We had wooden barracks there, and uh, we were out in the field like 90, 95% of the time. You'd get back to the barracks, and you'd be in the rapid reactionary force. You'd pull guard duty on the outside of the perimeter, and if there was a firefight going on anywhere, as rapid reaction force, they'd chop you off where the firefight was. So usually you'd get back to your base camp maybe once a month for a day or two, and then you'd be flying out somewhere else. So we really didn't see base camp much. And that's my final shot. It's just a Chinook helicopter flying away, and you can see it's sort of pretty blue sky with a few nice clouds in it. So there were some scenic days. Any questions? So like I said, this was probably covers about the first three months that I was in. After three months, I was promoted to sergeant. I took over as squad leader. And uh, then I really didn't have time to take a whole lot more pictures. And since you didn't get back to base camp, it was hard to get film. And I gave my camera to a friend of mine, and I think I lost the camera and never saw it again. But it was an uh, interesting experience. We did have a number of uh, battles that I probably won't go into at this point in time, but I do have it in my book. And uh, the reason for the book is I had attended a number of reunions starting about 10, 11 years ago with the 1st Infantry Division. And when I went to the reunions, people were saying, why don't people record this? Why don't you record that? And everybody was saying, well, why don't you write about it? <laughs> and uh, so there were battles there that were not recorded at all. And what uh, a friend of mine did, Major uh, Brigadier Sheldon, I shouldn't say a friend, a guy that I knew and I met, he wrote this book called The Beast Was Out There. And remember I told you about the battle that was going on while I was flying in the country? He documents, from an Army perspective, he documents that battle very well. And he was actually, he wasn't in the battle, but he was the intelligence officer and the operations officer overseeing getting supplies to these people. So he was the person seeing the 25 choppers come out, go out there, and the two coming back. So he wrote about it as best he could. Then. Dave Moranis, I, I met Dave Moranis at the Black Lions reunion. Dave is a Pulitzer Prize winner. 
and he won a Pulitzer Prize winner for writing When Pride Matter, Mattered on uh, Lambeau, not on Lambeau, on, uh, I'm thinking Lambeau Field, but who's the famous coach? Lombardi. Lombardi. Lombardi, yeah, he wrote about Lombardi's, Lombardi's family. He does a lot of research in that, and basically what he did is he took some of the information from the beast was out there, he covered the American part of the war, starting from when they put the D packet together, trained them, sent them on ship across to Vietnam, and then how they got into this battle. At the same time, he covered what was happening in the United States from a political standpoint. Because of the Freedom of Information Act, we could get information on what LBJ was writing about and you know what the thinkings were because of the Pentagon Papers and a number of other things. He covered what was happening in Washington, D.C. He also covered what was happening in Madison because he's got a close connection to Madison having been a professor there. And the peace protesters were holding a pre peace protest against Dow Chemical and it took over a building on the same day that the battle was occurring. So he's comparing that to what the soldiers were doing. And then he also traveled to Vietnam with uh, Sheldon and they interviewed the Viet Cong soldiers, the 271st VC Regiment and the Logistics Supply Company for the VC that was on the other side of the battle, the enemy. And it was very interesting when they pulled it together because the uh, Viet Cong had been told do not engage the Americans because they had been told do not fight with the Americans probably because they were planning for the Tet Offensive and they didn't want to take casualties. Well, they had come into this base camp the VC had looking for food. They were out of food because the 1st Infantry Division had destroyed a number of base camps and destroyed food supplies. They didn't have any food. They were looking for salt, but they had plenty of ammunition. And the Americans ran into them and pushed right into them, not knowing how large a force it was. So basically it was 1400 VC against about uh, two companies of uh, Americans, which would be about 260 people. And that, basically there was a company of American soldiers killed or wounded, and there was two companies of uh, Viet Cong killed or wounded. He documents it very well. So from being obscure, something that nobody knew about, now it's claimed that this is one of the ten well-known, one of the ten most written about battles in Vietnam. Now Tom Hanks is making a movie out of this. Remember he made uh, Saving Private Brian? The movie will be out in the first part of 2008. It was supposed to be out in 2007, but he got it involved with the Da Vinci thing. <laughs> so when that comes out, it's going to be, I think, probably one of the better movies on the Vietnam War. So because of that, I thought, well, you compare the size of these books to my little book. <laughs> I decided I'd write down my memories of what I had, you know, after talking with different soldiers of that. I didn't keep a diary while I was there because John Wayne never got the diary, right? I didn't have paper and pencil to do it with. John Wayne never had to go to the bathroom either. <laughs> That's very <right. laughs> good. So I documented what I did here. The books are for sale for $10, and it's like a 100-page book. But it uh, tells the adventures and the battles and that uh, in much more detail than what I have here, what I talked about today. The last thing I would like to talk about is John and I belong to the Vietnam Veterans of America and we do have a unique opportunity because the moving wall is coming to uh, western Wisconsin. It's coming to uh, Tremble Lake which is actually south, 10 miles south of River Falls. It's in between Prescott and Ellsworth on 10 and we're going to be setting up the moving wall on September 20th to the 24th. Now the moving wall is a half replica of the Vietnam Wall in uh, Washington, D.C. The Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C. is the most visited monument in Washington, D.C. And I have sort of been involved just in providing financial aid to that. And uh, so it's really been a success story because the Vietnam Wall does not have any federal support or state support. It's just support from ordinary citizens. And they've been able to put up the wall, maintain it. And they're, in the, they're also putting up a history museum next to it to explain different parts of the war because there is no history museum that does that on a federal level. So the moving wall, which is half size of that, will be coming 
to, uh, does anybody, that's where the gas light lantern is. Gas light. Um, Buildingville. Yep. No, it's not Bill and Bill. Close to Bill and Bill. It's actually down on 10 where Bill and Bill's on 29 or something. No, Bill and Bill. 35. Yeah, 35. This is actually on, on 10. So it's between Prescott and Ellsworth on Highway 10. Um, gosh, I think it's County Road N that runs right into it. So we will be getting information out on oh, that to, oh, to people oh, okay. that. It's right, in, right at the. Yep. The low part of the. Yep. Yeah, yeah it's right off yeah. of. Yeah, yeah, I know where that is. Right off yeah. of uh, 10. Yep. So, how long will it be there? It'll be there from September 20th to the 24th. So, it's a weekend in September. Should be beautiful down there because you got the Tremblay River flows through it. Nice level area for having the wall. And uh, the we've got 90 veterans in the BVA. And we've also worked with a number of other veterans organizations, and they're going to give us some assistance in setting it up and uh, running it and that. So I think for people that can't afford to go Washington, D.C., or don't want to or whatever, uh, it's a good opportunity for them to see the wall. And we're also contacting the 27 schools in four counties to let them know that this educational experience is there. The wall is neither pro-war nor anti-war. It just remembers the people that gave their lives, 58,240 some people. So that, that's something else that I thought I would let the people here know about that will be coming this fall. So it'll be, if you're here on the 20th and you want to take a nice drive down there, 20th, 21st, 22nd, 24th, uh, it'll be interesting. Admissions free. Will you have an urgent paper or something? Yes, we'll be contacting the local, local newspapers uh, probably sometime in August to let them know. And also just for you know, your own information, not that it's going to happen, but Somerset has been chosen as an alternate site if this site does not work out. We'll probably have it out by the Legion. We're not too sure on the Gaslight restaurant if that will be operational ownership changes have periodically out there. So we, we need to have them operational so we can get power and a few other things. But anyway, uh, I think it'll be a good opportunity for Western Wisconsin you know, to see the wall. It's an educational experience and um, it, it'll be in remembrance of people that uh, you know, gave their lives. Any questions? You know, one of the things that we never mentioned and just the bugs and the reptiles that we got to put up with. Uh, I mean, you know, things you don't see around here, like centipedes that were maybe about a foot, foot and a half long, one foot wide, and just white with big pinchers on them. And mosquitoes, early in the monsoon season, I mean, that things would nail you worse than I'd ever seen. So you'd put the poncho over you, and then you'd get too hot mm -hmm. you know, when you're out on. And snakes, I mean, the snakes that were. Some were four, five, six feet long. When we would get hit, half of our section would get on the gun and we'd just start shooting out any direction until we could see the smoke from the enemy and then we'd all just turn on them. But what we'd do is just put half the section, the other guys would get into the foxholes. And I was one of the guys who was up and I, there's one guy laying next to the foxhole. And I'm like, the hell in there, you know? And then we're back to doing business. And, Look over there, he's still laying alongside that fox. I'm like, get the damn fox. So after it's all over with, I go, boy, oh, what the hell's your problem? I tell you, get in the foxhole, get in the foxhole. So you get in that foxhole. Look in there, there's a cobra. <laughs> <laughs> he was on his way in, that cobra was on his way up. And yeah. he just got up. <laughs> Jumped out of the room. We had one experience, we were running dual patrols. So I was on point on the right side, and a friend of mine, Pappy, was on the left. All of a sudden, he froze. And I look, and there's a cobra, and the thing's going up sideways. So I take my rifle, I'm about 30 yards away, put it on him, and I said, you know, if I fire, I got maybe a 50% chance of hitting the snake at best, because it's pretty far away, and it's, you know, flat like that. So I just held it on, and I said, uh, I'll see how this turns out. And this, he stopped, totally froze, and the snake went down like that and moved away. He said, why didn't you shoot? Why didn't you shoot? I said, that's fifty percent chance. If I'd have missed, the snake would have got you. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> One of those things. Rats were in abundance. <laughs> lots of rats, lots of tarantulas and scorpions. Mm -hmm. you know, tarantulas, you, you, 
they'd show up at any time. Whereas the scorpions, you could usually find them underneath sandbags or anything like that. Get two of them and mark one of their backs, and then put one in this cup and one in this cup. Put a little piece of cardboard between it, shape them up, get them good and mad, then pull out the cardboard and dump them. In. Artillery <laughs> <laughs> had a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> <laughs> but the good thing go. is that when, when they were being fired on, we would get in the foxholes and wait for them to battle it out. <laughs> one of the weapons that we did have is one of our rounds was called a beehive round. And a beehive round was definitely just anti personnel. It was, our rounds weighed approximately 45 pounds. And this beehive round would have, I can pass this thing around, 12,000 of these in there. And that would, when you fire that round, as soon as it gets to the end of the tube. 11,999. Yeah, it would just fan out like a shotgun. And it, would, uh, it was very, very effective for taking people out of the wire that if they're, you're, you know, when you're having a ground attack going on or something like that. The, the beehive. But, we had the infantry in front of us. They were usually like over the hill, and if they heard us yell beehive, they knew, get your get butt down. down and stay down. So it, it, and it's a rip-roaring rip when that thing fires. Mm -hmm. That was some of the things that we used to have. Well, one. did that start scattering then right as soon as it left the barrel? As soon as it left the muzzle, yep. Yeah. It, would, it would just peel open like a shotgun shell. Or it also had a time fuse on it if you wanted to delay it, say there are a little off in the distance, you could delay it to where you get closer to them, you know, you direct fire, you, you look right at the target, basically just open up the breech, look down the barrel, and that's what you're going to hit, you know. Just taking, if you had a little bit of, there a little bit of distance, which normally there wasn't, but if there was, then you could put a little time on it, you know, maybe a half a second or two seconds. Right? Yeah, we had a 90 millimeter recoilless rifle that was about that big, 90 millimeter, and it was loaded with the same beehive rounds. So you'd put that in there, and it would fire like a tank. Equal amount of spreading in front, equal back blast. So you'd yell fire in the hole, and anybody behind you would duck down their foxhole because rocks and that were coming back their way. But that was very effective for uh, mass attacks. We tried to carry it out in the field, but it was just too heavy and bulky to carry it out in the field because the uh, shells would weigh about uh, eight to nine pounds. So it was very good for a, uh, at your night defensive perimeter. Uh, unfortunately, if you fired it three times, which I did once, you couldn't hear for two and a half days. It just <laughs> ruined your hearing. Any other questions on that? Was it always really hot there all the time? Pretty much. It, sometimes, probably, it, it might get a little bit chilly at night, you know, you could, uh, you'd get wet in that and it might get, it get down to maybe 60 or 70, but when you're used to 100, 60 or 70 becomes cold. When I came home here, it was like 60 or 70 in Minnesota at Walmart. I wore my field jacket all summer. I could not get warm. You know, when maybe get up to 70 and everybody else was complaining about how hot it was and I was cold. But there were times when, when it did get uh, chilly. I was up where the difference between where Lee was at and a lot, he was in more of the lowlands and yeah. I was up in basically in the mountainous area and during the day it would get hot but at night time you'd freeze your butt off. Mm -hmm. It would get cold. And five o'clock every afternoon here would come the rain. It rained, you know, this is not during the monsoons, this was during the summer months. So if you needed to take a shower that you had about maybe five minutes so <laughs> soap up and rinse off quick because you never know when that shower's gonna stop. <laughs> That was it would it would get very cold at night. I wouldn't probably maybe forty degrees, fifty. I mean, it seemed awful cold after you you know have a hundred some degrees during the day. And like I said, it is a long country, so from it's almost like California. Mm -hmm. From the top of California to the bottom of California, there's quite a bit of difference in temperature. What are your thoughts now, either of you? I, did that make a difference? And while were you there? While you were there, were you seeing progress, or were you seeing any benefit of what you were doing? And, and how do you feel now? Well, in terms of progress, uh, when I first got over there, we were pushing towards Cambodia. And uh, that's about when Westmoreland said he saw the light at the end of the tunnel. But then they attacked the, the uh, Saigon, and basically uh, there was a situation where, for the most part, they would fight when they wanted to fight. They wouldn't fight 
if you hit a base camp and they were in there, usually they would maybe know a few hours ahead of time and they could either scatter or they could fight. So generally they would fight when it seemed to be their, their advantage and we would try to, once we did find them, to get around them and encircle them. Yeah. If you look at the whole thing in total, the whole Vietnam War, we were in there for 17 years and the French were in there for about seven and the French came in right after World War II. Uh, counting the South Vietnamese that were killed and the North Vietnamese that were killed in the conflict and everything. There were, there were about a million people killed in the war. And to, to what avail? It, it ended up being a communist country. So, you know, you can look back on it and say different decisions probably could have been made. While you're there, though, you're, you're basically uh, fighting to survive. You're fighting for your men and that. So we really didn't talk much about politics because it didn't do any good. You had to focus on what your job was. When I was there, it was during the time of Woodstock, and it was also during the time of uh, Kent State. Mm -hmm. And when, I mean, our opinion, when these protesters were shot, we were going yay. I mean, that was our attitude. Sure. Was because, you know, we realized that, I mean, there wasn't any of us who were really like, hey, this is the fun place to be. You know, our, our favorite line used to be, what are they going to do, send me to now? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, you're already there, so. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and coming home, I, it had gotten where, when we ended up getting cut off in that one area where we basically, when we got out of there, I was supposed to have been home already. And I was, I finally got down to Cameron Bay to ship out, and I'm standing there and they're calling off dates. And they says, well, if, this, if your date isn't one of these dates, you're here way too early. And I went up and I showed the guy my orders. I was supposed to be gone two weeks before. And he's like, holy crap, we got to get you going. So I went to the front of the line, front of the line, front of the no KP, and <laughs> home. So it was just a matter of hours from the time, and plus you're crossing the international date line and whatever. If you can make good enough time, you can get back before you left. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I was like fresh out of the country. I just turned in my weapons and everything else, and I'm walking through the airport with my brother's peacock uniform on, and there's some clerically challenged fellow sitting there at the airport and as I walk by he says pig mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking 24 hours ago I could have shot you with a lot less remorse than that. <laughs> <laughs> today okay buddy keep on walking and it was changing too it was supported prior to the Tet Offensive the majority of the Americans supported the war then when the uh, Viet Cong took over half of Saigon and there were tremendous casualties, uh, people began to question the war. So it, it started to erode. Uh, Americans do not like long wars, and the Vietnam War lasted 17 years. So, I mean, there should be a lesson there that people should have learned. <laughs> you go in with overwhelming force, you win, you get out, you know. And, uh, you know, it was a long war, and the people were lied to. They were not given the correct information. The uh, information was always spun. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the battle I talked about, you know how what the news read about that? There was a Lieutenant Colonel Allen was killed, they mentioned that. And then they said it was a great victory for the Americans because they had stopped a regiment from reaching Saigon. They weren't even going to Saigon. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't even near Saigon. But, you know, they sp spun it as they wanted to spin it. They're still spinning today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's, yeah, once you got there, you fought. You fought to survive. But uh, that's one of the reasons why we didn't talk about politics. It didn't matter if you were for the war or against the war when you're there, because you were in the war. We and it, it sort of changed. Uh, I think it got tougher the further it went along. There were more drugs and stuff like that, and more protesters later on in the cycle. Because when I was there in 68, they started the negotiations. And they were negotiating for a month about the size of the table that they would sit at. And when John was there, uh, the negotiations had been going on for three years or four years to no avail. There were more people killed while the negotiations were on than there was before. So it was just a strange situation. We went into one area where we would do what they call an instant fire base. They drop like a 10,000 pound bomb onto the hilltop, literally flatten the hilltop, and then you'd come in with your choppers, but in the meantime, other artillery units would fire onto that position, and then the Phantom Jets would come in, they would do their bombing, 
and then the Cobra gunships would come in, and then we would go in. And this one particular time, just by chance, we had the, about a company size element of the North Vietnamese Army was passing through, and so, uh, I mean they were they were dead laying all over the place, and I was just totally surprised them. And so we were on this hill for maybe about a week and a half. We were getting sniped all the time. Jeps would come in and drop their bombs. You could almost reach up and touch them because they're just dropping all over the side. The sound waves coming off and that, and as the jet would pull out, you'd hear this crack, crack, crack. It was super gook. I mean, you just got bombed. How the hell can you <laughs> shoot it? They'll take an AK. But we were there for a couple of weeks, and then we decided to move down to this other area that was a bigger area. And we they installed these sensors for they could detect movement of people or whatever. And so we put them all over this hilltop when we left. And we went down to this other one. The first night, they're calling. They're saying, we got more movement up there than we had the first time. So we spent the whole night just firing the heck out.